Rafwerki is ending. It, his end could not come soon enough. He's 77 years old, and even though he may believe that he is going to last forever, it's clear that Isaiah Afwerki is a has-been who will be quickly forgotten in history. He has his, what is Isaiah Afwerki's legacy? He's taken what could have been the most prosperous country in East Africa, in the Horn of Africa, and transformed it into a ruin. By any objective measure, be it the World Bank, be it the International Monetary Fund, be it by any number of other independent assessors, Eritrea is, is a disaster, and it needn't be. That is the tragedy. Today, it's one of the poorest countries on earth. It's one of the most corrupt, and it certainly is one of the most free. That said, I'm very optimistic about the future of Eritrea. And my main reason for optimism is because of Eritreans themselves. I ignore what the regime says and what those under the pay of the regime say. The fact of the matter is, wherever Eritreans have fled, they have become vital members of civil society and of the economy. And there's no reason why they might not take their energy, their activity, and their ability and reinvest it in Eritrea to allow Eritrea to achieve what, frankly, it should have achieved decades ago. You know, Isaiah may believe that his family is going to take over, much like in North Korea, the Kim family has managed to keep control. That's a fantasy. Abraham, his son, is not going to be able to consolidate power. He's not going to be able to win the support of the army. Too many people may want to try to gain ultimate power once Isaiah is gone, once he's buried, he's not going to be able to influence succession. And simply because he may believe that he is God's gift to the world does not mean that the Eritrean people are going to want to continue with anyone in his family especially because, as I've said, Isaiah's legacy will not be positive and he will not be remembered well in history. One of the reasons why Isaiah will not be able to consolidate support for his family is because Eritrea, despite the frequent comparisons, is not North Korea. North Korea was able... Well, while there's a North Korean diaspora in China, for example, perhaps in Russia, some defectors in South Korea, the North Korean diaspora has not been able to thrive in locations with freedom. China has a concerted interest in keeping North Korea the way it is. Eritreans, however, are in the United States, they're in Europe, they're across the Horn of Africa, they're in the Middle East. And there's no way that the Eritrean diaspora is going to be silenced the way the North Korean diaspora is. That is perhaps the key point as we look forward. Location is huge in this case. It means that it will be impossible to isolate Eritrea and it will be impossible um, to prevent Eritrea from achieving what it is meant to achieve. There simply are too many people in the diaspora at this point. Imagine, right now, President Isaiah illegally seeks to impose and imposes 
a 2% tax effectively on ethnicity. This isn't like the American bad policy, admittedly, of our own expatriate taxation. Because when people are no longer a citizen of Eritrea, this tax is still imposed. And if they do not pay this tax, their family pays the price. It's organized crime. It's not simply taxation. However, one of Eritrea's greatest, uh, I mean, its greatest resources is, of course, its diaspora, is, of course, the remittances which its diaspora pay. Now, if the Eritreans had the ability to invest in their own country, invest in their own families, not as a means of paying off a mafia boss, but rather as a means to rebuild their country in a way that will grow its wealth, then there's no reason why they should limit their investments to 2%. The fact of the matter is, with a transparent economy, with a free market, with a transparent rule of law, where everyone is equal under the law, with a concerted effort to punish and criminalize corruption, then Eritrea could truly grow rich. Eritrea could be, to the Red Sea, what Dubai is to the Persian Gulf. We know that Eritreans are very much cosmopolitan. Part of that is due to the colonial legacy, and part of that is simply due to their location on the Red Sea. When you are on a major seaborne trade route, you're used to doing trade, interacting with people of all different faiths, of all different nationalities. Once again, this is going to be a major strength of Eritrea in the future. It's important, especially with Isaiah being 77 years old, to recognize that there will truly be independence, not independence as Isaiah had claimed in 1991, but a true independence, an independence from Isaiah of Werke's family and their parasitic history upon the country. Because Isaiah is 77 years old, because he has suffered strokes, because he's not going to live forever, it's crucial that all the diaspora and all the governments in the world start planning for the day after. The biggest disaster that could befall Eritrea is if any of the countries with which Isaiah deals, be it economically, be it for the military base, decide that they are going to intercede and crush the Eritrean people's desire for freedom in order to maintain a lease over, for example, the Air Force base or to be able to maintain a contract. Therefore, what it's crucial to come to a consensus upon is that when Isaiah dies, Eritrea can maintain its neutrality. It's not going to be a pro-American state. It's not going to be a pro-Chinese state. It's not going to be pro-Ethiopia or pro-Russia. Rather, Eritrea should only be pro-Eritrea. And yet welcome the contributions of all those from different nations in the diaspora. I'm reminded, for example, of Armenia, where there's a huge Iranian diaspora, a huge, uh, a huge Armenian diaspora in Iran, a huge uh, diaspora in Russia, a huge diaspora in the United States, a huge diaspora in the United Kingdom, and a huge diaspora in France. And Armenia is one of those places where all those countries that might ordinarily be at loggerheads are able to cooperate. The expression in English, of course, is when you're given lemons, you make lemonade. And Eritrea is well situated in the future to make lemonade if all those countries with an interest in Eritrea recognize that the greatest value for Eritrea is to remain independent, that it's to remain a, a space 
where there can be free commerce. Another analogy would be Lebanon to Syria. Let's face it, Eritrea is small when compared to the behemoth next door, when compared to Ethiopia. There's another analogy here between Lebanon and Syria. Lebanon is much smaller than Syria. And yet, because Lebanon is a maritime country, because Lebanon embraced mercantilism, because Lebanon wanted to trade with everyone, Lebanon, even though it still has corruption, it still has government dysfunction, even though it had the tragedy of the civil war, Lebanon was able to provide a breathing space and not become like Syria. That's, I, I would argue that Eritrea and Eritreans in their future should look at Lebanon as it was at its best, as perhaps a model which they could follow. And of course, when Lebanon descended into civil war, a lot of it was because of the diversity of the country. Eritrea has an advantage in this, in that it isn't beset by some of the same diversity, some of the same forces that tear Lebanon apart, even though, of course, Eritrea itself does have both sectarian uh, and, to some extent, ethnic diversity. So what Eritrea's diaspora should do is try to extract pledges from major countries, major power centers, Washington, London, Rome, Moscow, Beijing, Addis Ababa, make them pledge neutrality in the future of Eritrea. Let them agree that Eritrea is going to be able to choose a leadership and a system of leadership that the Eritrean people want. It's crucial that the opposition and the diaspora organize. Now, many Eritreans and many diplomats will say that the future of Eritrea is going to be decided internally, that those who are in exile shouldn't really have the same rights to talk about this. And you know what? That was the same debate that was had in Iraq. It's the same debate which is often had in Iran, was had in Russia, and so forth. The difference is that because Isaiah has ruled Eritrea with an iron face, fist, because he has driven out so much talent, that the talent is often the intellectual uh, ability to organize is outside the country. And therefore, it doesn't need to be an either or, but to talk about an Eritrea diaspora, cutting off the Eritrean diaspora from Eritrea itself is like cutting off the head from the heart. We need to understand in the international community that the Eritrean diaspora and Eritrea itself, those living inside, are going to play a joint role in rebuilding, revitalizing Eritrea as we work to the future. I truly wish that I could be with you today. Unfortunately, I am in Africa uh, myself doing research for, for some other work. But I do look forward to the day when I can join you, not only in the United States, but when I can visit you in what is reputed to be one of the most beautiful cities in Africa, if not the world. I long for the day that I can visit you in a free Asmara and I can make my first trip to Eritrea and witness the miracle which you will be undertaking, the Singapore of the Red Sea. With that, thank you. Good luck and Godspeed. You're muted. Yeah, thank you so much, Mr. Yeah, Dr. Rubin. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, good. Okay, I can log off. Thank you. Yeah.